Well, the shouting, the lawsuits and the riots are over and it's time to decide the 2020 election in the traditional American way by shouting lawsuits and riots. Today, as voters put on their hazmat suits, climb into their armored vehicles and fight their way to the smoking ruins of their local church or school, they will finally get a chance to cast their vote for either the abrasive orange guy or the corrupt senile communist frontman. It's an election day that takes us back to some of our most historic moments, like the Civil War and Now, it's pretty much the one. As we look out over the mighty land from the burning buildings of Philadelphia to the homeless people crapping on the streets of San Francisco, many Americans are feeling what is either a warm sense of pride or a fever of 104. (laughs) True, this year has been a tough one with a pandemic, a souring economy, and Kamala Harris's horrible, horrible laughter grating in our ears like what fingernails on a chalkboard would sound like if they were anywhere near as bad as Kamala Harris's horrible laughter. But rather than allow these troubles to defeat us, we've allowed them to reduce us to a nation of sniveling, mask-wearing stay-at-homes, quivering in terror at the sight of our own fingertips. As the great spectacle of American democracy unfolds before us, like a multi-car collision on a winding two-lane over a 400-foot drop into a rocky ravine already flaming with the wreckage of the many cars that went before us, who doesn't call to mind the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air, also known as Portland, Oregon? Today, we make our choice between four more years of panic and hysteria or one more year of the American Republic, followed by whatever the Democrats grind us into. But whatever happens, we can be proud of the fact that we live in the freest, richest, most powerful corporate oligarchy ever to collapse into chaos and oppression. So don't forget to vote. Trigger warning. I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky dunky. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo. Ship shaped, ipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! All right, we are back with the vast right wing conspiracy known as Clavenon. I know you're all. Worried about the results, so I'll give you the results. We now have over 200,000 subscribers on my personal Andrew Clavin YouTube channel. We're trying to get from there to six billion. Uh, so please uh, sign on now, subscribe, hit that little bell they have, and I will uh, arrive uh, personally at your home with new content uh, daily. Uh, in fact, I may just move in uh, and just hand you the content when when you wake up in the morning. Leave a comment. And if it's sufficiently absurd and nonsensical, we will add it to our commentary as because it'll fit right in. Uh, today, we have one from Mark Jackson. Uh, he's was talking about the way Biden talks and uh, the nonsense words he says. He says he, Biden simply failed at an attempt to plagiarize Inigato de Vita. Uh, he'd not have made that error had he had that last cup of kafifi. So a little iron butterfly uh <laughs> Humor. We always we always go right for the iron butterfly humor because that's how hip we are. Uh, want uh, t- we will do the mailbag tomorrow, assuming the country is still standing. Uh, so go on and subscribe. You got to be a subscriber to ask your questions. But go on to dailywire.com, hit the podcast button, hit the Andrew Claven podcast, hit the little mailbag symbol. Ask me any question you want. How do I get out of this burning building? How do I escape to another country? Uh, what do I do with the mob chasing me? Anything you want. All my answers are guaranteed uh, correct and uh, will change your life, uh, possibly even at the very end of your life. Um, You know, speaking of which, I've talked before about this bogus Democrat op called the Transition Integrity Project. This is where Georgetown University professor Rosa Brooks uh, gathered some Democrats and some never Trump Republicans and called it a bipartisan group, as they do. Uh, And then she gamed out various scenarios. What will theoretically occur after the election, right? This is Democrats and never Trumpers discussing what will theoretically occur after the election. And she then announced in the Washington Post, quote, a landslide for Joe Biden resulted in a relatively orderly transfer of power. Every other scenario we looked at involved street level violence and political crisis. Now think about that for a minute. Could there be in this world a greater indictment of the Democrat Party and a more compelling reason to vote for Donald Trump than that sentence? By her own admission, Democrats will riot if they lose. And who doesn't believe it? Could there be a greater indictment of the Democrat Party than the fact that store owners in Democrat cities are boarding up their windows today in case Donald Trump 
wins. And let me be absolutely clear about this. It's not that most Democrats approve of rioters. It's a small minority of people who even approve of it, let alone who do it. But that's the whole point. The problem is not the Democrat voter, the normal Democrat voter. The problem is it's the Democrat Party, the media and the huge corporations that are willing to condone the rioters and use them for purposes of intimidation. What does it say? about governors in Michigan and Oregon and Washington, about the Washington Post and the New York Times and CNN and all the huge corporations, Twitter, Amazon, Netflix. What does it say about them that they've been hiding Democrat street violence by misrepresenting it as mostly peaceful, that they've been encouraging it by misrepresenting police shootings in order to gin up passions and uh, excitement, Who have been th- that they've been excusing violence by trying to make it sound like a reasonable response to a so-called systemic racism in America, which is a nonsense term. And even insofar as it means anything, it's just not true. These people have spent four years telling us that Donald Trump is Hitler, an authoritarian, a threat to American democracy. But what law-abiding American walks in true fear because of Donald Trump? If they were in fear of him, they wouldn't be on TV calling him Hitler. What what law-abiding citizen has lost his right to speak or worship or defend himself because of Donald Trump no buddy. He hasn't shut down any churches. He hasn't told anybody they couldn't say anything. He hasn't pulled anybody off Twitter. They do that. In an Orwellian fashion, the Democrats have tried to bamboozle us out of our freedom by redefining words to mean the exact opposite of what they mean. Men are women. Racism is anti-racism. Speech is violence. But no one is boarding up his store in fear of speech. The whole country today is afraid of violence. And that's not the fault of Democrat voters, but it is the fault of the party they're voting for and the big corporations and powerhouses that support them. Well, it's election day and no one knows what will happen. No one ever really knows what's going to happen in the future. And that's why you should be prepared. Now is a better time than any to be prepared with long-term nutritional food options. ReadyWise has many options like emergency meals, freeze-dried fruits and vegetables for convenient on-the-go nutrition, new adventure meals for hiking, camping, and other outdoor activities. ReadyWise makes being prepared simple and affordable. You can order online and have nutritious meals shipped directly to your doorstep. Due to increased demand, supplies are limited and some items may currently be out of stock, but you want to get on this right away because when government resources are strained, it can be days, if not weeks, before fresh food is available. ReadyWise will keep you in stock. This week, my listeners can get free shipping at readywise.com when entering Claven at checkout or by calling 855-474-4084. ReadyWise has a 90-day, no question asked return policy, so there's no risk taking the initiative to get yourself and your family prepared today. That's ReadyWise, R-E-A-D-Y-W-I-S-E.com, promo code Claven to get free shipping. Be prepared. Know how to spell Claven. It's K-L-A. D-A-N. So look, I'm not going to spend today looking at the polls and telling you what probably is going to happen. The polls, if the polls are right, Donald Trump is going to lose. And if Donald Trump wins, the nation that the polls are polling doesn't exist. And that's what we will know. We will not, there'll be no, this time, there'll be none of this stuff like they did last time. Well, we basically got it right. We were just totally wrong. We were totally wrong, but basically right. It was basically, the rightness was baked into the rightness of the wrongness that was complete. You know, that we're not going to listen to this stuff anymore. This means that the pollsters are not polling a country that exists if Trump wins. And I, Personally, from my point of view, as far as what I know, reading the polls, looking at things, 50-50 chance. I do not know whether the polls are right or whether the um, or whether the, that country just doesn't exist anymore. They don't know how to find it. Even the statement, and we hear the statement every single election, and it, it's like a joke. Even the statement, this is the most important election in American history. When you think about that statement, that statement's a prediction of the future. Maybe this election isn't important at all. We won't know until the aftermath when we see the results, right? Because it could be that, you know, the Democrats will win the presidency, but not the Senate, and they'll just be all tied up. Could be that Trump wins and things go great. Could be the Democrats win, but they don't do all the terrible things we fear they will. We don't know if this is the most important election. We all of those things don't know. The future is not there. So the one thing I do want to look back on for just a minute before I talk about some of the other stuff, the other issues, the bigger issues that are out there. As I look back on these four years, I've often said this before, but I say it again. Freedom is fun. Freedom is fun. Obviously, the bad things that happen and bad things always happen, whether you're free or not free, those things aren't fun. Violence isn't fun. The pandemic and the lockdown haven't been fun. But the politics of this last year 
have been enormously fun. Freedom is fun. Poking the establishment in the eye by electing Donald Trump has is fun. Crapping on experts by <laughs> electing Donald Trump, absolutely fun. Making corporations and news media reveal themselves to be the low lowlifes they are, terrific fun. Just great fun. You know, the Democrats like to portray themselves as the counterculture, but is there a more lockstep, conformist, elitist, big corporation party than the Democrats? Being a Republican is fun. It is fun to be free. It is fun to fight back. It is fun to be an individual. It's fun to defy the, their attempts to silence us, their attempts to squash us, their attempts to force us into lockstep. That's where all the fun of politics is. All the fun is in freedom. And if Donald Trump is over the top, if he is sometimes boorish, if he is sometimes uh, unkind, if, even if he's sometimes dishonest, he's more fun. He's more fun because he's more free. He's more fun because he stands alone against the massive, massive deep state and the massive, massive structures that have grown up over the years that are not American, are not typically American. I hope he wins, if only so we can continue to have more fun. You know, I usually don't look at what other uh, commentators say too much. You know, I sometimes will read an op-ed or something. But uh, today I am going to look at uh, some of this just to give you my reaction to the reaction that people have, because there's not really going to be any news, uh, any new events until the election comes in, until the results come in. And we will be here at The Daily Wire. We will be covering that like crazy. We will be on it, as they used to say, like white on rice. But let's took, let's first take a look. I mean, you know, you want to look at some of the more subtle ideas that have come out of the mainstream media, out of the left. So here is their uh, basic take on Donald Trump. This is cut four. No, we won't. Call them fascist comments. Fascist. Fascism. Fascist. Xenophobic. Racist. Demagogic. Sexist. Autocratic. Donald Trump is a fascist. Someone like a fascist or a tyrant or an autocrat. Fascist. Hitler. Hitler. Adolf Hitler. 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 Well, Hitler. 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 He could well be just <laughs> an empty man, an empty yeah. human being with no <laughs> soul. <laughs> the measured intelligence, their high education, their credentials are so impressive. They're, they're so farsighted. When I talk about Donald Trump being fun, if he has done nothing else but pull the pants off these guys, but pants the media in one gigantic rip, that would have been worth having four years of Donald Trump to make these people seem to be what they are, which is they're buffoons. And they're still at it. They're still doing it. It's not like it's not like they said, you know, oh, maybe you know, in a moment of passion, we overreacted. Maybe maybe we went to it. They're still doing it. Here's CNN's mental ex, uh, health expert yesterday, Bandy X Lee. I mean, I don't know if she was, you know, if she's an X Lee and now she's something else, but she's Bandy <laughs> Actually, this is their mental health expert or some wag on Twitter said maybe she's their mental health expert. She she wrote, she tweeted, Donald Trump is not an Adolf Hitler. At least, <laughs> at least Hitler improved the daily life of his followers. He had discipline and required more of himself to gain the respect of his followers. Even with the same pathology, there are varying degrees of competence. <laughs> He doesn't have those Hitler's good qualities. You know? Donald Trump, <laughs> he doesn't even have Hitler's, you know, Hitler could be a nice guy. You know, sometimes when you sat with Hitler, the sparkle in his eye, you know, <laughs> and what, what I love best about this, what I love best about this is after being universally mocked, right? Bandy, the former Lee, I guess, because he's Bandy X Lee. She took it down, and here is her response to having said something so stupid that all of the internet world like shouted her down. She says, okay, I've taken it down since it has upset so many people and was not provoking thought, but the opposite. Of note, my statement was about how little Donald Trump believes he needs to do to retain his followership, not to minimize uh, Adolf Hitler's atrocities. If we cannot, you know, here's the thing, folks, if we cannot look at parallels in history and learn from them, we are truly poised to repeat it. I say so in heartbreak for the 11 plus million lives lost. Not, uh, uh, you know, I know most of you understood. In other words, she's learned nothing, right? She could have said yes in a moment of passion. I said something incredibly stupid. What an idiot I have. But that is the whole thing about the media. Not only has Trump pants them, but now they are running around in their shorts in front of us thinking they still have their pants on. That is the wonderful thing about our media. They are still doing it. Here is This is just the other day. This is Chris Cuomo talking to Tom Friedman of the New York Times with his, I think he was Cambridge, Oxford. I can't remember. He got a degree like my son got over in England, uh, an advanced degree. Here they are talking 
talking about the election. Cut, cut six. Few people are more respected for how they think and how they communicate than our next guest. And he says something pretty scary, that this could be the last week of America as we know it. We could have a, a, a prolonged period where we, we don't have a legitimate transfer of power for the first time in our history. And I believe the stress out of that, the economic dislocation and the violence of that uh, could be uh, just terrible. So I'm, I'm praying that doesn't happen. But I think that we have to we have to realize that given the extreme nature of this president, given the fact that he he has no bottom, he, he it, it's very clear, um, as I said the other night, you know, Al Gore, when he lost in a very close, uh, ultimately Supreme Court decided vote, he took a bullet for the country. Donald Trump will put a bullet into the country. And and if we if you don't if you don't think that's true, then you haven't been paying attention the last four years. Yeah, that's why they're they're boarding up their stores, because they're afraid Donald Trump is going to arrive at their stores and break the windows. That's why they're boarding up their stores, because Donald Trump is going to be so violent that just just his violence will make the stores break. You know, not one thing they've said about Donald Trump has come true. Not the, all this threat to democracy. There's a, a record number of people out on the streets waiting online to vote in this country. Where where was the threat to democracy? Let, let's take a look at their, uh, their the way they have predicted things. All the predictions they got right. This is cut three. Donald Trump feels the walls closing in. Really kind of the walls closing in on him. Walls closing in on him. The walls closing in on him. The first day of public testimony in the impeachment inquiry, opening with a bombshell. And we got the bombshell. A, a bombshell. A bombshell. Bombshell. One bombshell after another. Bombshell after bombshell. We're bracing for potentially an explosive opening statement. Explosive week. It's explosive testimony. Explosive. Truly explosive. The most explosive thing. This is a slow motion explosion. How explosive? Very explosive. <laughs> That's incredible. Explosive. I, I cut out the part where they looked and go, oh, I'm not wearing any pants. What, what happened to my pants? This is this is a wonderful thing that has happened under the Trump administration that has been added to the fun of living in America, of being a free person and of getting to look at the experts, the, the sophisticates, the high educated, the highly educated, the Ivy League people and realize they don't know Jack. And, you know, it's funny, the never Trumpers have been stuck on Trump's character. And, you know, I don't totally uh, dismiss that. I've, I've made comments about Trump's character. There are things about his character that I have definitely criticized. But the never Trumpers have really missed the point on this. You know, here is David French, one of the biggest never Trumpers. And he talks about the fact that during the Clinton administration was when Clinton was getting polished <laughs> by his intern in the Oval Office. Evangelicals rose up and said, what a what terrible character he has. Character is destiny. We've got to get Clinton out of the office. And they impeached him. And now they are not holding Trump to the same standard, says David French. What happened? Was it a theological revolution? Was it a new reading of scripture accompanied by copious apologies to Bill Clinton? As Al Mohler promised, it's, he said if he ever supported Donald Trump, he'd apologize to Bill Clinton. No, it was nothing like that. It was nothing like that. It turned out, y'all, that the commitment to character and leadership, which was grounded in truth in 1998, was grounded in something else that was even more powerful than truth to an awful lot of Christians, and that was partisanship. When it came time to carry a cost to a commitment of character, Christian conservatives deserted the field. Now, the problem was when they deserted the field, they didn't change the underlying theological truths that they articulated in 1998. Indeed, they could not change the underlying theological truths in 1998 because those truths weren't up to them. Yeah, but those truths weren't true. You know, before, before I came on, the God King of the Daily Wire texted me and said, you know, the the attack on Clinton was politically motivated, too. I mean, these are all political things. And the fact is, the very fact is that the Bible does not teach that character is destiny. It teaches that God is in charge. That's why you got guys like King David. This is what the evangelicals have been saying. They say, take a look at King David. He was he did terrible things. He did terrible things. The prophet of the Lord, Nehemiah, came to him and said, you are a bad guy. You are the man who is doing the bad thing after he uh, seduced Bathsheba and then had her husband essentially killed in order to escape the fact uh, that he was the one who would, that he had slept with her. You know, that's pretty bad. That's a pretty bad thing. His character was not so good, but God was in charge. And that is the reason that a lot of evangelicals look at Donald Trump and say Donald Trump has preserved 
our religious freedom. It's not Donald Trump. Again, again, it's not Donald Trump who has been um, who has been shutting down churches while letting riots go on. It's not Donald Trump who knocks religious people all the time. He supports them. Is he himself a deeply devout man? No. Has he lived a life of the life of a pious Christian? No, he has not. I mean, in fact, his life has been openly what it is. But the thing is, you know, in a lot of ways, his character with its flaws, with its freedom, with its sense of humor, with its rollicking, freewheeling, uh, you know, commonsensical approach to things, does represent us in a lot, a lot, in a lot of ways, and does represent the character of this country, and that I think is an important pa- fact about his character that is frequently, frequently overlooked. So many people love this my pillow, and they love it because they just can sleep comfortably on this incredibly comfortable pillow. That is a wimp's reason because I am up all night and I want to be comfortable while I'm awake. Who cares when I'm asleep? I want to be comfortable lying awake. And that's why I love my pillow. They really are great. They actually are. They're just terrific. They are as soft as they can be, or you can get them any kind of, uh, any kind of tension you want. And they really feel good. I told you my, my wife stole mine and you can get the Giza dreams sheet made with this Giza cotton, which is just terrific. Uh, they are now on sale at two for one low price plus free shipping with promo code daily wire. Go to mypillow.com and click on the radio listener square to check out the two for one low price on the Giza dream sheet plus free shipping. There are also deep discounts on all other my pillow products as well. Enter promo code daily wire or call 800-651-1148 for these great radio specials. You will really sleep comfortably as I lie awake comfortably. You know, again, I don't often like to have other commentators because I figure you're hearing, you want to hear what I have to say, but Tucker Carlson said something. Now, it's something kind of like what I have said in, in the past, but I think it's really important. I think he says it particularly well. He's taking a look at that incredible gathering out in Pennsylvania, this small town of Pennsylvania. Just It looked like there was nobody left in Pennsylvania to vote against him, which is why they have to bring in fraudulent results, because there's just nobody left to vote against Donald Trump. And he talks about the fact that I have taught, and I have talked about it too, that these people were dying. They were dying and nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. They were killing themselves with opiates. They were d- in despair. Uh, there's, he mentions that in this little town, there's a, there's a monument to the people who have died from opiate uh, poisoning. Nobody cared. And those opiate poisoning, a lot of that was pushed by major corporations, big pharma, as they say. Uh, you know, and, and this is the kind of thing that a lot of right wingers were sitting around going, big, there's nothing wrong with big pharma. Big pharma, you know. These are the people. This is the country. You know, the thing is, the thing is, the patient, the thing that we are trying to gather around is not David French's religious sensibilities and not his moral sensibilities and not his moral sensitivities. The patient is the people's freedom. That's what we were gathered around. And here's what Tucker Carlson says, why Tucker Carlson says all these people turn out for Donald Trump. Millions of Americans sincerely love Donald Trump. They love him in spite of everything they've heard. They love him often in spite of himself. They're not deluded. They know exactly who Trump is. They love him anyway. They love Donald Trump because no one else loves them. The country they built, the country their ancestors fought for over hundreds of years, has left them to die in their unfashionable little towns, mocked and despised by the sneering halfwits with finance degrees but no actual skills who seem to run everything all of a sudden. Whatever Donald Trump's faults, he is better than the rest of the people in charge. At least he doesn't hate them for their weakness. Donald Trump, in other words, is and has always been a living indictment of the people who run this country. That, it, it, that is so true. And somebody once said Donald Trump is a middle finger sent to the elites and to the deep state and all these people who, for some reason, for some reason, they've been wrong about everything. Their cities are a mess. But for some reason, think that they have this golden glow about them, that anybody who disagrees with them is hateful and anyone who disagrees with them is a fascist and anyone who disagrees with them doesn't understand the real America that they've never even seen. They've never even gotten out of their plane midway across from one coast to the other and taken a look at what's going on out there. Gerard Baker also talks about this because what I like about these guys is when you compare them to what I was playing before, he's Hitler, he's a fascist, he's an authoritarian. When you compare them to all that stuff, listen to the way 
the right talks. If you go and read the New York Times op-ed page, this is what you hear, the screaming, the fascist, oh, the death, you know, the greatest threat to America since World War II. But listen to what you hear on the right. Here's Jared Baker, a very, very conservative columnist in the Wall Street Journal. He says, you don't have to believe a single word of the media's hysterical hyperbole about Donald Trump these last four years to think that this president is seriously lacking in the character of the men and women who have made this country the greatest nation on earth. You don't have to think he's Hitler's heir to be alarmed by his evidently cavalier disregard for small all matters like the independence of the judiciary, the proper use of executive power, or the truth. You don't have to think he takes personal joy. This is a conservative talking now, and as Trump supporter, you don't have to think he takes personal joy in incarcerating children in cages to worry that his underdeveloped capacity for human empathy has made him especially unfit for the crisis of the past year. Yet for all his faults, for all the illegitimate fears stoked by the last four years, it's not immoral or irrational to think that the incumbent still represents a better alternative to what's on offer. I mean, that is the thing. It is a binary system. And anybody who tries to think his way out of that is trying to think his way out of a brick box. It is a binary system. If you don't have Trump, you're going to have the other guys. They are worse. And, you know, it's it's interesting to me. You've got this guy, Biden, <laughs> who's now being exposed as a pretty venal character. I mean, the stuff that has come out so far from this Hunter Biden laptop really does show that he may have been profiting not just from Chinese uh, companies, not just from Russians who were certainly paying off his son, Hunter Biden, but he himself may have been profiting from a Chinese company that was, in effect, a Chinese intelligence operation spreading the influence of the Communist Party into the West. He may have been profiting from that. That's, that's not great character either. And the way he talks to, you know, he's talking about this. Um, he's talking about the flu all the time because Donald Trump is the flu. He's the virus. Uh, here's cut 18. He knew in January how dangerous it was and how many people could die. And he said nothing. He didn't say a thing to you, me or anybody else. He kept it secret. He hid it from the American people. He knew it was worse than the flu. He lied to the American people. He knew it wasn't going to disappear. He kept telling us a miracle was coming. Or maybe we should inject uh, bleach into our veins. I mean, whatever. God, what a... Anyway. You know... (laughs) They always make fun of Trump for watching TV, for staying up and watching Fox News and reacting to that. But Biden repeats every major media lie there is. He wants you to inject bleach in their veins. Uh, he kept the he hid things from the American people. He said there were great people in the uh, the white supremacist movement. He denies he loves white supremacy, all this stuff. Uh, Biden just repeats it. And the thing is, the media who spreads this stuff in the first place, it nods and just says, okay, that's right. We thank you for spreading that around. You know, and, and the other part of this also is this. When I talk about the fun of Donald Trump, here's, here's what Biden says about ha- how he's going to handle the flu, which, of course, is nothing. Uh, he's cut eight. Last night, Trump said he was going to fire Dr. Fauci. Isn't that wonderful? I got a better idea. Elect me and I'm going to hire Dr. Fauci. Not f- and we're going to fire Donald Trump. It's that, that love of, uh, first of all, Trump didn't say that, but, for, but, but he hinted he might do it. <clears throat> um, but, but it's, again, that love of expertise, that love of top-down government, that love of the elites and the corporations telling us what we can say, what we can do. It's just built into who Biden is because he's been in government for 400 years. They call it 47, but they forgot the other 350 years he's been in government. And they always look at Europe. They say, look, they have that. What, all other civilized countries, they say. <laughs> All other civilized countries, they have single payer health care. They have government health care. That's what we need. Remember, it's a big effing deal, Biden said to Obama. The hospitals in Europe are overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed. They were telling us that Germany was doing so great. Germany overwhelmed because they, you know, they pay less for health care. They do pay less for health care, but they get less. During here's the Wall Street Journal. During the spring surge of the pandemic, treatment in many European countries was rationed, as it often is, by age. Older and frailer patients were denied admission to Italian ICUs. The Sunday Times reported last week that UK patients over age 80 and some over 60 with underlying conditions were left to die. Patients over the age of 80 made up 60% of the UK's deaths, but only 2.5% of those in this age group 
were hospitalized and received intensive care. That's that's what single payer health care is like. They keep saying there are not going to be any death panels. There are death panels. There have to be. There have to be. And that's why we're still a beacon to the world, which is another thing, another thing about Donald Trump, what he represents to the world. I know they hate him. They disdain him. They think he's an idiot. But, you know, Walter Russell Mead, another one of these uh, columnists that I like so much, who I think is very measured, very balanced. I don't always agree with him, but he's very balanced. He says, he says that the world is still watching our election. It's, they still care what we think, despite all the talk about our power fading and we're in decline and China is the future. Despite all of that, they care what we think. And this is why he says America is an experiment in self-governance. The U.S. is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. No a- aristocracy, no cultural or technocratic elite, no religious hierarchy, hierarchy ever quite manages to govern Americans. And no smooth-tongued demagogue has ever persuaded us to dismantle the constitutional fences that protect our inherited institutions. Some well-meaning peop- Americans think that our many flaws undermine the power of our example to the world. That's not the whole story. For admirers of liberty around the world, the example of our democracy is all the more compelling because the faults of U.S. society are out in plain view. The history of American democracy is not a story of sages and philosopher kings. The U.S. story is rich with examples of racism, political corruption, hypocrisy, and crass materialism. U.S. history is not a tale of preternaturally virtuous people overcoming temptations that lesser nations cannot resist. <clears throat> if it were, the American example would not be contagious. But if boobs like us can make democracy work, then there is a chance for people to make it work anywhere. And in so, at some level, this is what all of us who voted for Trump and all of us who support Trump are trying to say. These guys, these experts, these kings, these little princes, these little princes like uh, Jack Dorsey at Twitter, these little princes like Jeff Bezos at Amazon, they're not the boss of us. We're the boss of them. We run the country. We're the people. And you know what? You don't like it. Guess what? Here's Donald Trump. And I hope we say it to them again. You know, Donald Trump hasn't changed much about my um, my politics, but he has changed some. You know, I'm going to I'm going to stop here and take a, a, a break and I'll talk about this more in a minute. One of the things I always wonder about is how people live with themselves when they do something dishonest for a living. You know, I mean, I don't mean something that's not that great, something that's a little sleazy. I mean, when you actually are a crook for a living, how do you sleep with yourself? There are actual people who make money by spying on your Internet activity. You can thwart those guys with Express VPN. That with ExpressVPN, you can make sure that 100% of your data is encrypted and that your internet provider can't get hold of it. ExpressVPN creates a secure tunnel between all your devices and the internet so that everything you do online is encrypted. It reroutes your connection through a secure server. This blocks your internet provider from seeing everything that you do online. All they can see is you're connected to an ExpressVPN server, but nothing beyond that. Your data is your business. Protect it at expressvpn.com slash Claven. Visit expressvpn.com slash Claven to get three extra months of ExpressVPN protection for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Claven to learn more. Don't let anybody go online and find out from you how to spell Claven. Keep it secret that it's K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's. No easy, <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You know, it's election day, and I know many of you are saying, what? Oh, man, I forgot. It's election day. But we have an ama- We will remind you that it's election day, even though it slipped your mind. We'll remind you with a great day of programming. Our live stream starts today at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, featuring special guests, live interviews, and more leading up to our very special election show, where we will be re- covering the results with you in real time. And we will let you join Daily Wire now and get 25% off with code ELECTION so you can watch all our election coverage live on our Apple TV or Roku app. Watch the election with us today at dailywire.com and get 25% off your Daily Wire membership with code ELECTION when you sign up today. Come over to dailywire.com and subscribe. And also, you can be in the mailbag tomorrow. You know, a lot of uh, never Trumpers told me when Trump took office, when I supported him, when I voted for him, that he was going to corrupt me and change my politics and uh, and make me a, uh, you know, a, a fascist and all this stuff. 
But really, my politics have remained pretty much the same. But there is one thing that Trump has changed, and it is an important thing, that I've become more of a, I won't say a pacifist, but certainly more of a non-interventionist because of Trump. I think Donald Trump has been right about this. And I, I have started to feel, as I've watched the ends of these the ends of these endless wars in the Middle East unfold. One thing I've started to feel is that I want my um, I want my fellow American fathers, if they get that horrible, horrible note from the military that they have lost uh, a child overseas, uh, I want them to know what it was for. I want them to understand that he gave his life for something, not just for some kind of vague notion that we can make a difference. You know, we've been fighting in Afghanistan for, uh, what is it, 20 years now, over 20 years, and Trump keeps saying we should come home, and the military keeps saying, no, 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 oh, oh my gosh, if we come home, you know, and I think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, if we come home, what? If we come home, what? It will be a primitive medieval country of tribal warfare. That's what it is now. That's what it is before we got there. That's what it will be after we left. And the argument is, well, they launched 9-11 from there because the Taliban took over. But the 9-11 didn't generate from there. It generated from all those, uh, you know, Islamist mosques that the Saudis were paying off, were paying for in order to keep the people pacified while they made all the money off their oil. You know, that's a bad system, but there's not that much we can do about that. You know, we do. We are not gods. We're not the we don't run the world. And I have to say, as I've watched Trump and I've listened to him and I've listened to the arguments against him and all the people who say, oh, if he pulls out, everything's going to be bad. You know, I, the left is right about something. The left is right about it. they're wrong that other cultures are as good as the West. They're not. They're just not. But they're not wrong that other cultures should be left alone to be themselves, you know, only because we can't do anything about it. They're wrong to think that other people should be able to break through our borders at will and come and live here no matter what they believe. But they're not wrong that they should be able to live in their own crappy countries <laughs> unmolested by us. We can't save everybody. We have to lead by example, not by force of arms. And I think that that's something that has changed me. You know, so this is, you know, I've given you some of the subtle commentary uh, from the right. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's take another look at the subtle, nuanced uh, commentary of our betters, our superiors on the left. Here's a uh, cut one. When he said today, America first, it was not just the racial, I mean, the, I should say racial, the Hitlerian uh, background to it. There was an America first committee. They were infiltrated by the Nazis. Many of them were anti-Semitic, part of why they weren't alarmed by Hitler's rise in Germany. Outside of the Civil War, World War II, and including 9-11, this may be the most cataclysmic event the country's ever seen. But he's just disgusting to look at. Uh, he's obese. He's one of the repulsive, physically looking human beings I've ever seen. Absolutely no morals. Who's a bully, who acts like a bigot and a racist, and is a sexist and a sexual harasser. The nuance, the educated, the gray areas, you know, the way they weave their way through the complexities. He's fat. He's fat. Fatty, fat, fat. I mean, that's the, the level of commentary we have gotten. And again and again, it is so much more fun to look at the world as it is and to be a free individual having one's own individual opinions. I know some of you, you know, some of you, when I talk about Donald Trump's flaws, you say, well, you shouldn't talk about that. You know, I just think, no, no, reality is where the game is. Reality is where the fun is, you know, and more than just not just physical reality, but moral reality. We don't abandon our morality to follow some guy. You know, we don't put our trust in princes. We're the country. We are the country. The individual decisions that we make, the businesses we build, the families we build, that's the country. The country is not in Washington. They want it to be in Washington. They've been bleeding it out of us and taking it to Washington, but that's not where it's supposed to be. And that is what, what makes Trump more fun. That's what makes Trump more fun is because he allows us to be the, the country. You know, I mean, I know he takes up all the oxygen in the room in terms of political commentary, but he's not changing my life. He's not doing anything in my life. He's not coming to my house. He's not uh, starting riots in my city. He's not taking me off Twitter. He's not silencing me or anybody else. It's all the left. It's all this lockstep corporate oligarchic idea that somehow the top is where things should be. So, you know, Trump is out on these stumps. This is the other thing about Donald Trump. This is the other thing that's fun about Donald Trump. All these people with their masks and Biden with his mask and the people on TV going, oh, he's not wearing a mask. He's not wearing a mask. Listen, I'm an older guy. I haven't got the greatest lungs. I get this thing. It could kill me. 
You know, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying that. I'm not saying that that's not a bad thing. Of course, it's a bad thing. Of course, death is a terrible thing. Disease is a terrible thing. And I'm not minimizing the pain that people have suffered or anything like that. But knowing that, knowing that the thing is here, knowing it is what it is, how are we to live? How are we going to live? Donald Trump goes out there without his mask and he meets people and he greets people and he gets COVID. And two days later, he's back on the on the trail, back on the campaign trail, while Joe Biden with his mask is holding the phone. Even when you take his mask off, he can't. That's actually what he's saying. It's not that you can't hear him because the mask is on. It's because he's making no sense. Donald Trump had the energy of the guy, the absolute you, you got to call it courage of the guy, the, the way he shrugged off this disease. Isn't that what we want America to look like? I mean, I, I get it. I get it with all his flaws. But isn't that what we want America to look like? Do we really want it to look like all these people pointing at one another and say, oh, you, you're not wearing a mask. You're not. I'm wearing a mask, but you're not wearing a mask. Is that really what we want America to be? You know, you talk about the guy's character, but you got to talk about the guy's character in a positive light as well. And in fact, in some of the things some of the ways his character represents the best of this country. This country has always been a chaotic place. It's always been a place of loonies and frauds and guys who just use freedom as a way of, uh, as a con game that they can play off other people. Always been that. It's always been a place of Barnum and Bailey's. It's always had a sort of a, a paper aspect to it. Every, you know, go back and read Huckleberry Finn. That's what, basically what that book is about. All the frauds along the river and all this stuff. And Donald Trump partakes of a little bit of that energy, but he also partakes of a little bit of that freedom, a little bit of that courage, a little bit of that inventiveness and creativity and the idea that, hey, you know what? I, I know that all the experts say you've got to solve the Palestinian problem before you get have peace in the Middle East, but maybe you don't. Maybe the experts can go hang, you know? I mean, Donald Trump also partakes of that. So when you talk about his character, you got to talk about that too. And that's why, you know, I think that th that is why sometimes you hear the left actually do get a little nuanced about how Trump should be treated. Uh, like, for instance, here, this is a little montage. Uh, this is cut two. The case for impeachment has never been stronger. The evidence never so riveting. Are you suggesting that President Trump should face impeachment? Another member of Congress wants him impeached. There's growing talk, at least, about impeachment. What is your case for impeachment? You know, that's, you know, and the the other thing that's kind of funny is uh, Joe Biden, when Joe Biden goes out and talks about the country, when he tries to sound a note of hope instead of that anger, if you look at him, he looks just like, I'm, I'm trying to think of who it is he looks like. I think it's one of the critics maybe on the Muppet show. I can't remember just that stern, not angry face. But when he talks about what's good about the country, this is really fascinating. This is the last uh, cut I called for at the end. We are better positioned than any nation in the world to lead the 21st century. Our workers are three times as productive as other workers. We have the biggest economy in the world. We have the strongest military in the history of the world. We have the most innovative entrepreneurs in the world. And we are virtually energy independent. We have more great research universities in America than all the rest of the world combined, out of which all these new inventions have occurred. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't think I can stand four years of the nonsense. But think of everything you just said. Think of everything you just said. We're energy independent. That's because of fracking. It's entirely because of fracking that he's going to he's going to phase out He's going to fade not right away, but he didn't phase out maybe Thursday, maybe not Tuesday, not Wednesday, but maybe Thursday. He's going to phase that out. That's why we're energy independent. The military, we have the strongest military in the world. Barack Obama gutted the military. Now, you can hit Trump on spending and military spending and military spending is out of control because of the way they spend it and because they don't really vet their contracts enough. But but. When you have equipment, when you send our guys out with what should be the top equipment in the world, it better be the top equipment in the world. And under Obama, it simply was not. So all of that stuff he's talking about is Trump. And when he talks about the innovative businessmen and the innovative re research places, all of that requires the kind of freedom that he does not want and that Trump does. That was actually a campaign speech for Donald Trump. You know, I got to I got to tell you that Donald Trump is more with all his flaws is more representative of what's great in the American character at, than than Joe Biden has ever been or can ever be. I, you know, I do not know what's going to happen. And finally, there's this. And, and this to me is the most important thing. Trump supports our freedoms un, unabashedly, unashamedly without and, and in act in deed as well as in word. I mean, and that's important because it doesn't matter if you're supporting our freedoms, if you're pounding the drum of our freedoms when you're cutting them off all the time. This, this thing that the left did, and it's only the left did it, only left-wing governors did it, where they shut down churches 
but let riots and protests go on, where they thought that somehow it was more important that people march in the streets over a systemic racism that's a figment of their imagination than that they went to church and prayed to a God who is more real than they are. That really is a problem. And, and Mike Pence uh, talks about this as a cut 15. Under President Donald Trump, we've stood for that first freedom, religious freedom strong. We restored the conscience rights of doctors and nurses. And it was President Donald Trump who ended the assault on the little sisters of the poor and the Supreme Court made it permanent. You know, and that that is another thing. I'm not going to go off on abortion, but just the fact that people have the right to a conscientious objection to abortion. The left doesn't even believe in that. They don't even believe in that. They don't believe, yeah, you can go to your church and pray if we let you. You know, if we open them, you can go and pray. But, you know, don't don't actually do the things you believe in because we have a right to kill our children. And that's, you know, the Baal demands that we kill our children. So we don't want you worshiping the Lord. Pence even went out and called on people to pray a moment that I just, it really got to me because I just think like, who does this anymore? You know, I mean, and on the left, who does it? At all. No one. Joe Biden parades his Catholicism, but how does it impact what he does? How does it impact how he sees the world? How does it impact his stance on abortion, which is now as radical as it's possible possible to be? Here's Trump calling for prayer. We ought to claim those ancient words that have seen Americans through much more challenging times than we could possibly imagine. The words of an ancient promise that say, if his people who are called by his name, will humble themselves and pray and turn that he'll do like he's always done in the long and storied history of this great nation. He'll hear from heaven and he'll heal this land. This one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And I love the fact that they join in there. I mean, this is this is the thing. You know, I know a lot of us are worried. Um, you know, we're all we can't help but be anxious at a moment like this. We don't know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to happen. We don't even know what's going to happen if we win or lose. We, we know nothing. We know nothing. But we know God is there. We know he's in charge. And so remember that I'm going to leave you with this scene from Chariots of Fire. And I say leave you, but I'll be with you all day. The Daily Wire is going to be covering this from 3 o'clock Eastern, uh, 12 o'clock. No, it's three, what is it? Six and three? I can't remember now. I'll, I'll look it up so I don't, don't say it wrong. We're going to start our programming at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And then we'll, have, we'll be on all night, obviously, probably into next month until we get an answer. But I will leave you with this. This is a scene from Chariots of Fire, a really fun movie uh, with Ian Charlson, a great actor. And he played a, a runner named Eric Little, uh, who was in the 1924 Olympics when the British were desperate to win. They had a chance to win. And he was a great, great runner. And he refused to run on Sunday because he was a religious man. And in this scene, he goes before the church. Uh, he goes and preaches in church when he could be running. And he reminds them. He reminds them of what really matters and how little some of the things we worry about most matter at all. So I will leave you with this. I'm Andrew Claven. This is the Andrew Claven Show. Go out and vote and do not leave the line. Don't be a big mouth who spouts off about your right wing credentials and then you get tired of standing on line and go home. Hold the line. Stay on and vote. Don't let them call the state. Don't let them tell you the machines are broken. Stay there and vote. We still have a chance here. I, th I do believe we have a chance here. And I think that no matter what happens, what you're about to hear from the book of Isaiah is the truth. The nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as the small dust in the balance. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing. And vanity. He bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as a vanity. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no strength he increaseth might. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up 
with wings. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wadowski. Edited by Adam Saivitz and Danny D'Amico. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, is by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Astrologers predict a win for Biden. Cookies predict a win for Trump. And the Pennsylvania Attorney General gives the state to Joe before Election Day. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.